All right, let me, let me begin to share with you today, and I'm going to reiterate some things that I've already talked to you about. Remember, we're in the election cycle, and you need to pray about our country because I did a little when we began because there are some, these riots that are beginning to happen remind me really of the 60s when sometimes in some places whole city blocks were burned. It gets so, so violent. And so we just need to pray for the safety of our country and the safety of people that uh, ought to have the right to congregate and share and so on. I think that's one of the amendments, right, that we have a free speech. Amen. So uh, let me kind of begin with my introduction. If we are to have exponential growth in the Lord, that means really supernatural expanding growth. The Bible gives us the paragon path to follow. And so since faith comes by here, and let's look at Romans 10, 10, 17, I believe it is. And we'll just use right at the beginning. So then, let's read together, please. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we know that our rudimentary means of developing spiritually is to become knowledgeable and then acquiescent or receive to the Word of God, to the Word of God, and make personal application of what we learn. Often people hear the gospel; they they may even read a, a certain portion of the gospel per day, but they never learn how to apply it. You know, just hearing the gospel is just the potential. You know, hearing it that gives you the potential of it going into your ear and being filtered down into your spirit and doing you some good. Otherwise, it can go in one ear and out the other. Many people have been in church all their life, and yet if you nailed them down and even tried to ask them about just rudimentary doctrines, basics, and try to give you a little teeny explanation of any basic you would ask them, and many people just are not equipped to do so, not trying to criticize you, but to enlighten you that you can be different. You can be different because the more you get into the Word of God, faith comes by hearing. So as you hear the Word of God and you regurgitate it and, and rehear it and hear it and speak it, then it begins to have an imprint, an imprint on your life. The Bible reveals that the impervious process to accomplish this, that is to have it come into your heart and change you, is a systematically line upon line, ethic upon ethic, sequence upon sequence. Have a sequacious spirit. I love the word, it just means to be obedient, submissive. But you have to have an obedient spirit because when you get into the Word of God, it will change you if you allow it. And it's always a change for the better. One of the things people really have that are living in the world, living a worldly life and enjoying the things they do, whatever that may be, have a hard time believing that if they submit their life to Christ, that life's going to be worth living. Somehow they believe that if you accept Jesus, that you, uh, you know, and you're denied doing the things that they've been used to doing, that life's going to get miserable and awful lonely and uh, miserable, as best I can say. And misery loves company, but it's not the truth. See, it's a, it's, it's a delusion that that's the case. And that's why the church is hated to the degree it is. And that's why the name of Jesus is hated. Because they know that that means there's going to be a change, and they don't want change. And you can't get saved if you're not willing to have a change take place in your life. So it aids us when we submit to the Lord to, to, in our quest to find maturity in Christ. And so this is what we're talking. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if they can get it on the board, I didn't give this scripture to them. As you know, I edit my scriptures, I edit my messages as I preach. First I get them, then I have other people edit, just make sure it's all correct, what I mean correct, the scriptures are correct, and, and the, you know, whatever, punctuation in the right place. Then I get it, then I study it and go over it, and then I edit it. And then I come in the pulpit, and I, you have a printed copy of it, and you say, oh, boy, I'll again follow him. And you just start relaxing, and you just sit back in your seat, and you say, I'll just read with him. And then suddenly he stops doing what you thought he was going to do. But anyhow, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you have to, I, you know, I make no apology for it, but you'll have to excuse me 
that I have fun preaching. Now, if you're used to sour pusses and, and they don't, you know, they, everything is under pressure and stress and uh, they want you to pray for them because they're almost stressed out. I'm going to tell you something. Don't pray for me because I'm not stressed out. If you pray for me, say, Lord, continue to bless him. <laughs> Amen. I've learned not to get stressed. And I mean that sincerely, but I, I trust the Lord. But here's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. Let's read it. Therefore, if anyone, now this, see, I want to address that person that didn't have a father, didn't know, had a father, of course, but didn't know he was, and feels like, as when I talk about the Father God, that the Father God's waiting to smash him, as he said, or she said, because I can't tell what it is. But notice this, this is for you and for anybody else, no matter what your situation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I'm going to talk about that new creation. A lot of time we say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. But what does it mean? I'm going to give you some detail. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, what I shared with you last week and the week before began to touch on it, and I just used an analogy because it's election time, of planks. A plank in, a, in, the, in, a, in the election cycle, when the, when the conventions happen, those are planks to give you a basis of what this, what this party stands for, for instance, what pro-life, pro-choice, whatever it happens to be. And so it, they're called planks. And, and so the planks that we have in this new creation has to do, number one, with being pardoned from the penalty of sin. So you have to, that's part of the process. That's what the Holy Spirit's work is. Holy Spirit causes this to happen in your life as you surrender to God and allow the grace of God to flow in your life. Now imagine the rap sheet that you have in your life. The sins that you've committed. The Bible said, he, the, sinner, the sinner shall surely die. He that sinneth shall surely die. Something has to be done with sin. You can't go unabated. Something has to happen. Either you have to come to Christ and ask him to forgive you of your sins and have your sins cleansed, or you're going to have to pay for your sins. Now, the penalty that normally has to be paid for sin is death, spiritual death. Not annihilation. Spiritual death simply means shut off from God and in a place, a very bad place that you wish you never went to. So you just have to understand that. That's a separation from God. So when you come to Christ, just imagine this. He pays the penalty. He is the payment for your penalty for your sin. You should have paid it. I should have gone to the cross, not Jesus. He was perfect. He went to the cross for you. That's why I wanted to sing that little chorus, He was nailed to the cross for me, because I know He was. So we know that he, the pardon, so we're pardoned. And just notice the process. We're just kind of reviewing this part of it a little bit. So we go from pardon to justification. Now when He justifies it, now imagine this. He not only pardoned you from the penalty of sin, but now He justifies you in His sight just as if you never sinned. Think of that. I don't know what kind of a past you have. It makes me very pleased and happy and relieved. Hallelujah. <laughs> really get some relief if you know that he not only pardons you, pays the penalty, but he also justifies you just as if you never sinned. That's what justification is. And then we know that after he has justified it, then... See, our penalty's been paid. We're clean, but now we need to be regenerated. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, in a way, they became born again, but not born again to Christ. They already were in Christ. In order for them to have the curse pronounced upon them, they were kicked out of the garden because they disobeyed Christ, disobeyed God, and believed the devil. So in doing so, they became a child of the devil. The Bible says he's the God of this world. Jesus admitted that himself. So it is necessary. That's why you need to be born again. Did you ever think that? that's not born again? Doesn't mean you've been born physically. Then you should be born spiritually. No, it means you've been born spiritually, all right, but you've been born into hell because the devil is your father because you followed him. So it's necessary then to get born again, and this is what this is about. 
He takes you as a person that's been pardoned, it's been justified, and he regenerates you. This is not retrofitting you. This is not remodeling you. God's not in the facade business. We put a facade on the building. We can have a house that looks terrible, unpainted for years, and yet we can put siding on it, man, it looks like a brand new house. But if you were there, you know what's underneath that siding. So he doesn't remodel you. Hopefully you get changed and, and, and improve upon on the outward and in your life and so on. But what God does is spiritual inside. And he creates in you a new heart. You get born again. He creates, he regenerates you. So you were degenerated, came out of the garden because of sin and the curse. Now we're regenerated. Regeneration that makes them a new creature. Now, this next thing, adoption, we mentioned this, and you'd think, well, if a person is born into a family, why should they have to be adopted? Well, you just have to understand what the Bible means by when it says adopted. We're adopted, that is, as a person that the penalty's been paid, justified as if they never sinned, regenerated, and then God takes them in that regenerated form and he places them or adopts them into the family of God. And so we, we, what we get is an assignment then. See, every Christian is under assignment. You may not recognize what it is. Some people, the only thing, a lot of people want to get into the ministry. They're not called. They just want to get in because they think that's the only way that they can fulfill an assignment. As you know, ministers fulfill just a small portion of the assignment business. In fact, our calling, our calling is to disciple the saints and equip the saints so that they're capable of doing the work of the ministry. So I think we have a whole idea about ministry that's, you know, quote unquote, you know, it's true. Ministry is a gift to the church. There's no doubt about it. He gave one. He doesn't say he gave one the gift to be a pastor. He says he gave pastors. He gave the gift, the, the person is the gift. Different than the gifts of the Spirit, because then the gifts of the Spirit are given by the Holy Spirit to the general ministry, uh, to the whole family, or, and the laity and everybody else. But when notice there, it says to one, a person is given the gift of the word of wisdom or whatever. But notice when he gives out the gift of the ministry, he gives the person to one and he gives, he doesn't say he gives one the gift to be one. He just says he gives them an evangelist. He gives pastors, teachers, apostles, and so on. But the purpose is for the perfecting of the saints. So that means that when you come into the kingdom of God, you have to adapt yourself. Now, adopt is the word used, but adapt and adopt can be a little bit of interchange if you get the point. And you are adapted or adopted into the family, and you then are under assignment from God. I call it a mandate. I use all kind of terminology. I'm an operative, you know. I don't know what else I use term. You know, we know that we're agents of God. Uh, we're, we're his extended hand. He says, the Father has sent me, even so I send I you. I think the church doesn't realize who they are. Because we've been beaten over the head for so many years. All we know about, oh, we're sinners, we're old sinners. I hate that term. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Hey, I was an old sinner. When I was an old sinner, you knew it. But praise God, I've been saved by God's grace. And it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. See, I knew you, but you didn't know me. You thought you knew somebody that looked like me. A lot of things have happened to me since you knew me out there on the street or wherever it was. Help me, Jesus. I don't know if I'm making friends or enemies here today, but, but some of you know what I'm talking about because you're in the same shape. But notice that Jesus became the firstborn. The Bible explains that, that. He became the firstborn. So we're following him. As he became the firstborn, born out of death and the life, raised from the dead, we are born into his family. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also, now watch this closely. This is not Presbyterian doctrine. Presbyterian doctrine, uh, they don't mind because we're friends that don't make any difference, just see things different, that's all. But anyhow, they, they see this and believe that God foreordained some to be saved. And if you're not foreordained to be saved, you're not going to get saved. 
And God knew this ahead of time, whether you're going to be that person. So for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. But because God knew everything about everybody, he knew ahead of time what decision you were going to make. He created you as a free moral agent, so we can't lay this blame on him. Well, I can't help it. He didn't call me. He calls everybody. He, he knew whether or not you was going to accept, that's for sure. But that doesn't mean he doesn't beckon and knock on your heart's door. Come unto me, he says, all you that are heavy and laden, and I'll give you heavy and laden, I'll give you rest. So he knows about you. And then the Bible also says something very interesting. It says that Jesus was crucified from before the foundation of the world. That means God was not caught by surprise because you went astray. But you see, God wanted to create you as a free moral agent. God didn't want robots. Everybody, you know, a robot, you know how they do. You know, everything is just... God gave you a mind so that you could decide. You could say, you know what? I don't want God in my life. Not in that. I, I'll just take it at hands, you know, arm's length. I don't want him to affect my life, so I don't want to get too close. That's why I don't go to church, Brother Dave. I, I don't like to, because then people want me to act like them. I don't want to be like them. I don't even like them. I don't even like the way the church smells when I come in there. I, one thing about be good about being around a long time, you've heard about everything there is to hear. <laughs> they say the, advantage, the, the disadvantage of getting old is that you've been everywhere, done everything, and nothing's new. But uh, that's not true either. So just take it all with a, a grain of salt. So the Old Testament believers never had the privilege of going through this experience. Imagine with them it was hard because they had to keep the, the, the rigorous regulations and, and the laws. They had to keep them explicitly. And even though we knew they couldn't, and there was a high priest that once a year would go into the Holy of Holies, and, and he had to be very careful that he was right with God, or he may not make it out of that tent. But he'd go in there and... People would hear the little rattling because he had little bells or something on the bottom of his gown as he walked around and prayed and, 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 and covered the sins. They weren't removed. They were covered. Old Testament, you couldn't have your sins removed. They were just covered and the next year covered and just kind of put on temporary, what shall I say, remission, if I, if I can use the term. But the reason people went to heaven out of the Old Testament was because the best they could, they believed the prophets. They believed the testimony. The best they could, they sought God. They tried to do the best they could with what they heard. And they did good enough so that they made it into paradise. Because we know paradise is a temporary place where when people died, and they died in the Lord, their life was safe for the rest of their life, they would go to a compartment in somewhere in the bowels of the earth. And aside from that, across a chasm was Hades or Gehenna, a place that was the abode of the wicked. So we know that when Jesus raised from the dead, before he came out, he went into paradise. And, and here are these, who knows how many thousands, I don't know, tens of thousands, I don't know how many more in there, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not a bean counter, but I mean, if you're a, uh, an accountant, you want to know exact all these figures. Don't matter to me, all I know is a mass of people. And Jesus walked into paradise and said, I know whom you've been looking for. Can you imagine, you talk about a fiesta, a gala, a Holy Ghost re reunion, when they, they got to be with Christ, and Christ released them from that temporary abode. So all the souls that people, souls and the spirits that, you know, their bodies that got planted in the ground like you had to do uh, somewhere, burned or whatever the case may be. And, and they all came out, and they went, and now the Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. So that's the basic difference that has happened. But believers uh, in the Old Testament, they, the best they could, they tried, and they, it sufficed them to get into paradise. But now we have no excuse. 
You talk about the uh, computer age, God was the head of the computer age. He gave us all the ins and outs, how that we can feel justified, how we can walk through life and not depend upon how good we perform, how holy we look. You know, you know when I first got in the ministry, for, I was a fledging minister, I don't know how many years this happened, but <clears throat> probably first 10, 10 years or so, I would never go in public without my shirt and tie on. I mean, without a tie, I always went out in time, even in the daytime, didn't matter what, I work in the garden, my tie on. I don't know, I thought I had something to prove. I had to look like a minister. I know you didn't care, but I thought I might embarrass you if you try to, if, you, if I see you out in public, <laughs> and I have my civvies on, <laughs> I have my uniform on, I thought maybe I'd embarrass you. Say, well, this is my pastor. I thought, my Lord, I have to look like a pastor. Then I got to thinking, what does a pastor look like in the first place? I started looking through the Bible, all the people God called, some were characters. I don't know if I want to be like them or not. Well, you know what I mean. It's just, uh, it's just a, a, a learning experience as you go along. But we have the assurance because God has given us the process that when we come to him, and we can tell this same story to any person. We don't have to get into all these details about these planks and so on. I give it to you because that's the way it is when we're growing in the Lord. We want to know more and more. And the more we have some, some insight as to how it works, it's easier to explain to people. Isn't it easy to explain to a person when you come to them and you know they lived a hellish life? They may have just got out of prison. I mean, for killing somebody. We've had every kind come to our church, believe me. We've had five people attend our church that killed somebody. Said, well, I'm not coming to that church. They must have the killing spirit. No, we don't either. <laughs> it's just that we're open and people feel very free to come no matter what their background is. But imagine we can tell people when we testify to them, not, hey, come to our church. That's what the first thing was, come to our church, meet our pastor, come to our, hear our choir, whatever. No, the first thing we ought to tell them, hey, I know you got some pretty heavy burdens and baggage that you're carrying. I want to give you some good news. If you'll come to Christ in spite of your background, in spite of what you've done to hurt people, in spite of what you did, you deserved what you got. You did the, did the crime, you had to do the time. But listen, because they can, they can relate to this because they know about the rap sheet. They know about penalty. They've endured it. They had to go before a judge, and they know what it is to hear a judge say, I sentenced you. One 22-year-old got sentenced to 28 years in prison. Just, just, I just saw it in the paper this week. So imagine when you can come to a person and say, you're the guilty one, but Jesus went to the cross to pay your penalty. He's taking the rap for you. You see how that relates to prisoners? Not only prisoners, but how it relates to sinners who feel guilty. You know, most people are not insensitive to what they've done. They may hide it. They may bury it. You know, however, they're, they're managing to survive through it. But generally, people, people know that they've done wrong. People don't forget that they hurt somebody, did something that brought harm to someone else or, or hurt to someone else in one shape or another. And so those things build up, and that we call it baggage, and it gets in there. We hide it. We jam it down in our subconscious some way, and we kind of survive it. But the pain of it remains. Imagine being able to tell a person, listen, that pain that you feel, that guilt, that shame. There's, there's many a person I've talked to. They seem tough on the outside. They seem like, man, nothing matters. But they feel shame. They feel shame of what they've done and how it's hurt them and hurt those around them. But imagine being able to, you've you got to be convinced yourself first. Some of you are still not convinced that your past is gone. You're still carrying it around. I see you carry, you come in. Well, sometime you leave it back here in the lobby. We get pretty loaded up in the lobby, some all these big sacks, I don't know what they are. But really, that's what life's like. We carry the thing. We go, to, we go to Christ. We ask him to forgive us. And then as we walk away, we put it back on and we start dragging it again. 
But imagine being able with great conviction and tenacity, look at a person in the eye and say, listen, Jesus died for you so that your past is removed as far as the east is from the west. It's hard to do. I know it's hard to forgive. Depends on the intensity and the, of, of the severity of the sin. But Jesus, you can tell a person that's what's good about what we have. You can, he'll, he'll forgive you and he'll pay, he's paid the price for you. And then you'd give them the process. And imagine, in God's sight, it's just as if you never sinned. Oh, imagine what that feels like when you've been a guilty old sinner. You carry the guilt of that sin over and over again. And somebody's able to tell you, you just lay it at the cross because he died for you. He was on the cross, but you were on his mind. Name is name. Joe, Tom, Jane, whatever it is. It's wonderful. Old Testament saints never had that privilege, but we have it in the New Testament. And that's why I can with great fervor tell our friends, they're fellow human beings. I don't judge them on the basis of, of their humanity, for sure. But we have many people who have been raised in, in, in religions and they're great religions. Some of them are great in size, quantity, large. And some, some of them have a great deal of impact on people's lives. But one thing about the Muslims and even the Jews who are not Messianic, non-Messianic Jews and Buddhist, you name, you can go down the line, Confucius, Toast, all the rich religions of the world, You'll notice that there's no religion that gives people an assurance that they're going to go to heaven. And so what they're doing, they're either killing themselves to get there. And I noticed the Paris guy. Did you, I don't know if you read about him. You know what happened in Paris last year sometime? 130 people were killed. And you remember some had vests around them and had these explosives. And they exploded themselves. In fact, the guy they just caught the, the, the guy was kind of the leader. They'd been looking for him. He had one of those on. His brother went ahead and exploded himself. And as you know, all these people were killed. And this guy got unnerved and didn't do it. And they got him. And he's talking. Someone said, you believe in waterboarding? Let me just tell you something. If that guy had done that in Canton, Ohio... And I could get some information out of him if there were some additional terrorists in the city and going to do the same amount of damage they did. I won't say waterboarding. Maybe I have a different way to do it. I guarantee you one thing, he'd be telling me what he knows. And he's doing that in Paris. So I don't know how they're doing it, but they're getting the information out of it. But it's, a, but it's strange that to them, to people like that, I don't say every single one that's a Muslim, but I mean, there's a whole lot of them that believe that if they can do something in the name of Allah, and killing infidels is a plus. They can get credit for that. Gold stars after their name, so to speak. So that's why imagine the advantage you have as an equipped born-again believer, and you're dealing with somebody, and you can say, listen, you can know now. In a second, you, if you pray this prayer with me and you mean it, and then explain, you have to give them some explanation. We know that's just the beginning. That's the door where they come in. A lot more goes from there. But there's got to be a beginning. And you can tell them, look, if you'll do this, you can have this. Imagine the difference. Paul says this. He said, if in this life alone we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. If that's all there is, I don't care how many years you live. My Lord, a man just died 112. There's a lady 115. And the guy 112, he golfed till he was 100, you golfers. <laughs> he fished till he was 102. And he still walks all over the place. He lived with his son, 112. I don't care how many years you live. Life is too short. And Solomon tells it a lot. You can read through there. You read his writings and you'll see what he says. All is vanity. He talks about a person works all their day, all their life, and they get some something stored and they have some assets or however he describes it. And then somebody else gets to spend it. <laughs> There's one guy in the church. He did pass away. But you know what he said? He said, if I knew, and you that are the offspring of him, be glad that he didn't know when he was going to die. 
He said, if I, I know he's just kidding, but anyhow, he said it. He said, if I knew the day I was going to die, man, he said, I'd spend every single nickel I have. I would. <laughs> because, as is taught by Solomon, otherwise, somebody else spends it. You work hard all your life. You save this. And you know what I found a lot when people inherit something? Very seldom do people appreciate what you worked for when they inherit it. Almost always it goes like water through their fingers. There are some exceptions. If you're an exception, God bless you. There's not a lot of them like you, I'm telling you for sure. I've been around long. See, that's what happens when you've been around a long time. You've dealt with too many families and you know too much. Any wonder they kick pastors out every three, four, or five years. I always wondered why they did that. I never, they didn't teach that to me in 101 and when I was in school, I didn't know you were supposed to leave every five years or so. I don't know. I suppose I had a different philosophy than other kind of pastors. I decided that when four or five years comes and they feel like they've had enough, then they go. <laughs> well, I told you about the guy. I hadn't seen him. He had come to church. Man, he loved the ministry. He was around a couple of years and I was a good friend. And suddenly I didn't see him anymore. So, I don't know, months went by. I finally saw him. I said, hey, I missed you in church. He said, well, Brother Dave, I think I heard about everything you had to say. I thought I'd go around and find out some, something else. Go to another church. Kind of reminded me of the guy that got stuck on an island. Two guys were in a plane, and they went down, and you just couldn't get any help. They were stuck out there in the plane. So, as you can know, two people after a while become enemies. <laughs> and so... Uh, this one guy built a hut where he lived in. The other guy had a hut, and he built a hut. So this guy built three huts. He built three huts. And the guy, when they finally rescued him, said, Now, why do you build three huts? He said, Well, one hut I live in, and the other hut is where I used to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> but the blessings of the gospel never ends for me. Not only he came to bring salvation, but also to bring the good news of the kingdom of God. And this involves the preaching and teaching ministry of Christ, and we continue it. We help people to live so that they can find peace in the midst of their storm. The church is the instrument to continue the work of Jesus. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I send you. We are obligated, folks. We are under indictment if we don't. And we're under assignment if we do. And God has something for all of us to do. You can't all sing in the choir, although we wish we could get you in the choir. We put all of you in the choir, we put some other people out here. And then you could see what we see from up here. And it's a pleasant thing. I never get tired of looking at you. You're really nice. Now, sometimes I see you yawning real big and kind of sleeping with your eyes open. You think I don't know the difference between sleeping with your eyes closed and sleeping with your eyes open? See, there's a certain way you set your neck when you sleep with your eyes open. And you kind of, your neck is up here and then you settle it in. And a glaze comes over your eyes. Your, your eyes are open, but you ain't seeing nothing. You're dreaming something. I don't know what it is. Come on, let's stand up. It's, we're just having a good time here today. Come on, let's stand up. We're just having a good time here today.